long, long ago, the ancients told of a great prophecy that a mighty eagle and three courageous warriors would one day vanquish the dark lords of the underworld. I am Princess Maya, Tekka Eagle Warrior. I'm proud to fight beside you. I'm Timmy, outcast of the jungle lands. Rico, magic rooster wizard of Luna Island. I am Pichu. So it begins the story of our beloved friends. We're the warriors from the great prophecy. You have no plan. It is time you face some real gods. Deca princess. You fight my yacht. You fight us all. Oh yeah, it's all. Crush these cockroaches. Nobody messes with me, familia. I got you, Maya. Barbarian. If it is to be. It is up to me. Describing his upcoming Netflix animated series, Maya and the Three, as a love letter to Mexican culture and something to honor the warrior women in his life, creator and director Jorge Gutierrez joins us for this episode of Behind the Screen. A writer, director, producer, and animator, his credits also include 2014 animated feature The Book of Life and 2008 short series El Tigre. Maya and the Three is an epic fantasy series that follows warrior princess Maya voiced by Zoe Saldana, who embarks on a journey to save humanity from vengeful gods. The ensemble cast also includes the voices of Diego Luna, Gabriel Inglesis, and the legendary Rita Moreno. I'm Carolyn Jardina. Welcome to The Hollywood Reporter's Behind the Screen. Jorge, thank you so much for joining us, and congratulations on Maya and the Three. Carolyn, it's so good to see you again, and, and thank you so much for, for having me. As you can tell, I'm super excited. I'm so glad we finally get to talk about it. Right? I mean, as we were just saying before this, I've been working on this thing for three years, so getting to talk to people who've just watched the whole thing is kind of a magical time for me. Well, to get started, when you did your panel at Annecy, you described it as a hyper-love letter to Mexican culture. Tell us about the idea for the story. <laughs> so the, the big inspiration uh, was, you know, been lucky enough having done El Tigre and, and the Book of Life. And as you know, I adore where I'm from and I adore Mexican culture and I adore sort of the buffet of delicious food that's been served uh, to me. And I always looked at Mesoamerica and the Aztecs and the Mayans uh, as something that was very, very inspiring, but very also intimidating because of the history of it. And it's all over popular culture in, in Mexico and in Mexican-American uh, culture. And you see these images of Aztec warriors and Mayan princesses. And you see, you see all this stuff everywhere, and tattoos and, and in lowriders. And I said, all right, I think it's time for me to really go there. And as a kid, uh, I grew up in Mexico City. And I would go, I, w I got taken by school to the uh, National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, which is freaking insane. It's just incredible, this museum. And at that time, already, I was obsessed with comics and, and you know, animated movies and, and TV shows about fantasy, about dragons and wizards and knights. And then I remember going to the museum and hearing the people talk about these are these warriors and these are these gods that, you know, came down. And then these are, like, I started hearing that stuff and going, holy cow, we have that. We've had that. All the stuff I love, we have it. I just never get to see it anywhere. Uh, and I remember going home and telling my dad all about it, and he got really excited. And that's kind of when I fell in love with this mythology and this lore. As I got older and I got to make a bunch of stuff, I would always reference it. Uh, for, but for Maya, it was the first time I said, I want to make something about a warrior princess. And all the folktales I read and all the mythology I read, Women tend to be the object of desire or the, you know, the, the evil witch. They're never the heroes. 
Uh, and I looked around and I realized a lot of my work, the main characters have been male and I have to change. So I, I, I said, I'm going to write a love letter to you know the three warrior women in my life, my wife, my sister and my mother and everything they've gone through. I'm going to try to put it in this. Uh, and I've had this idea since Book of Life. It's just been sort of cooking and cooking and cooking. And I kept going, this is too too big for a movie, and this is not right for a TV show. And so when this magical moment in in streaming happened a few years ago, you know, in 2018, I got asked, pitch us something you don't think you can get made anywhere, right? I don't think... I don't think I'll ever get asked that question again by Netflix. Uh, I think it was a different time. But uh, when they said that, it just came out of me. You know, that the tombs, the tombs of my ancestors all over Mexico started shaking with joy. Uh, and, and that's how Maya happened. And tell us about just working with Netflix, because it sounds like they gave you a lot of creative freedom to tell your story. You know, I, working with Netflix has been an incredible experience. I have, you know, I've been around uh, and I've worked at a lot of studios. What made working with Netflix different for me was that they they did not have a legacy. It wasn't like there were these giant franchises that we had to uh, live up to or to some extent extend. And there was no consumer products and theme parks and all these other things that your movie or show had to fit into. So that was very different. Uh, the other unique thing was a lot of the creators and directors that were brought in, we were all a healthy mix of veterans and up and comers. So it was incredibly inspiring to be among that group. Uh, I, looking back, I think we were trusted, but also there was so much stuff going on. I don't think they had time. <laughs> to look into what every, everybody was doing. Uh, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that, but there was just a lot of stuff happening. Uh, and, I, and I've always believed, you know, in the history of animation, a lot of the great things happen when no one's looking, right? SpongeBob and, you know, The Iron Giant. Like, all these beautiful movies and TV shows have happened when there was a bigger fire and, uh, and the Eye of Sauron wasn't looking in that direction. <laughs> Uh, and I think with Maya, we, we got really lucky. We got a ton of creative support, a ton of trust. And more than anything, we pitched something that had never been done, and they went for it. So it was on us to prove it. And that was the thing I loved about Netflix. They said, if you make something terrible, it's on you. If you make something great, congratulations, it's on you. Well, let's talk about this story. Maya is such a, you know, strong, you know, well-developed character. And then along her journey, uh, we have the three, the warriors and friends that she makes along the way. Was the Wizard of Oz something in the back of your mind when you were telling this? Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you picked up on it because it's definitely the Wizard of Oz uh, influence. Uh, you know, Maya, uh, obviously, is Dorothy. Chapa is Toto. And then the three are basically, you know, the... The lion, the Tin Man, and the uh, and the Scarecrow. Although there, you know, some gender changes in there. Uh, For our listeners, w would you describe each of the three characters there? Uh, so the the three uh, represent, to some extent, different ideas uh, about being a teenager and and sort of coming to terms with what that means and growing up. Uh, so Maya is, you know, obviously very much inspired by my wife. I, we met when we were teenagers, and I met this really rebellious girl that I, you know, still deeply, madly in love with, and she was so feisty. And I, you know, one of, one of our first dates, I dared her, I dared her to, uh, to punch me in the face, right, as a dare. <laughs> and before I would, could finish saying that, my nose was bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> she punched me so hard. And as the blood like went into my mouth, I, w I literally went, I'm going to marry this girl. She's amazing. <laughs> so that's, that's basically Maya, this, this very rebellious teen. Uh, Rico, uh, one of the things that happened to me was when I went to CalArts, so I'm originally from Mexico, but then I grew up in Tijuana. And when I went to CalArts, uh, something magical happens. Where I didn't know, first of all, I didn't know I was Mexican until I, I left Mexico. But then the other thing that happened was I got grouped in with people from uh, different parts of Latin America. 
And I had had very little interaction with people from other parts uh, of the continent. So for the first time, uh, because of the Spanish, I was hanging out with people from Puerto Rico and people from Peru and people from Argentina and people from Brazil. Uh, again, we were paired because you guys were the Latin Americans and it just sort of naturally gravitated. So that was the inspiration for the three. It was me meeting people from all of Latin America uh, and then going to festivals all over Latin America and seeing how amazing everybody is at representing where they're from. And so originally Maya was going to take place in a very sort of uh, just Mesoamerica. But then I said, no, that, that hasn't been my life experience. I met people from everywhere. So we opened it up. Uh, and so, you know, Rico is from Luna Island, which is kind of inspired by modern Caribbean culture. Uh, and then Pichu is from South, 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 uh, you know, pretty much Peru, uh, going all the way and, and getting some Incan influence into the series. So that that was kind of the idea. Uh, Chimi is very much inspired by Mayan culture. And of course, uh, Maya and the Tecas very much are the Aztecs, right? Teca, Azteca. I also love the, uh, the saying that she uses throughout the series. If it is to be, it's up to me. Tell us about that theme. Uh, so you know, I'm kind of a I'm kind of old fashioned that way in that uh, I write the theme of whatever my project is. Uh, so for example, Book of Life was uh, always play from the heart. Like literally, it's in the show. It's in right. the guitar. It's in the <laughs> thing. Uh, for Maya, it was if it is to be, then it's up to me. And again, that was the guiding sort of philosophy and this idea that this is a magical world and there's all these armies and creatures and gods, and but it comes down to a single person and a single choice. And if everybody makes that choice, then you can make that difference. So that became sort of the unifying theme of all of them. Uh, and early in the show, when she says it, she doesn't really know what it means. And then at the end, she figures out what it really means. You selected Zoe Saldana to voice Maya. How, how did you select Zoe, and uh, what do you feel that she brought to the character? So Zoe, <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I talk about this a little bit in the art of book. So what happened with Zoe was I adored, adored working with her on Book of Life. And we really sort of connected, and, and it was just a great experience. So at the premiere, Zoe uh, was pregnant, and I remember telling her, Zoe, I have this thing about a warrior princess and you have to play her. This is at the Book of Life premiere. And poor Zoe was pregnant with, you know, all the reporters. And, and she goes like, okay, I'm down. But her mouth said that, but her eyes looked terrified. So years later, I, I ran into her at, a, at an awards thing. And I was like, Zoe, remember that, that warrior thing I told you about? And she went, yeah. It's time. I'm like, it's happening. <laughs> So then finally, uh, it all came together and, and, you know, Zoe's brilliant. And when we recorded, we would laugh and there's moments in the show where Maya's crying and, and Zoe's, a, she knows this is not on camera and Zoe cries. So it's, 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 it's quite the experience, uh, to work with someone, uh, with her, her resume, right? Like I'm a film nerd and a film lover. So it's hard for me to grasp like the directors that she's worked with. <laughs> so I'm always, I always try not to think about that stuff. Uh, but yeah, Zoe was the heart and soul of, of the series. And I really believe she, I mean, a lot of it, we improvised a lot of it, we changed and a lot of it was her gut. I would go, all right, Zoe, here's the moment. What do you think? You think this is the way to do it? Or is there a better way to do this? And she'd go, all right, let me give you what you wrote, but let me try other stuff and let's, let's play. And that's always the best when you, when you do that. I also, I'm a big lover of mistakes uh, and in, in, imperfections uh, in the voice performances, because I think that's how we talk in real life. And I really don't like an animation when all the voices are so perfect and everybody talks like a robot. So Zoe is especially good at adding those sort of human, human touches and little slips and swallowing words or stuttering a little bit. All that stuff to me adds so much texture. Uh, and I, I, I think her performance in Maya is, is, is amazing. She's great. Let's talk about some of the other cast members. Um, you, how did you get the legendary Rita Moreno? 
<laughs> All right. So I've been a, a Rita Moreno fan my whole life. Uh, you know, West Side Story is one of my favorite movies. Yes. And I, 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 of course, uh, you know, living legend. And I remember uh, I, I just, you know, her character is basically the god of the gods. Uh, and I remember uh, when I said, oh, well, I'd love to get Rita Moreno. I was basically told, there's no way she's going to do this. Uh, and sure enough, she said yes. So at the first record, I remember her, we were finding the voice. And she goes, so hold on. You're telling me the god of the gods is a Puerto Rican woman. I said, yeah. And she goes, I love this thing. <laughs> So it was it was a joy. It was a joy to work with her. And, and you know, she's as great as everybody say, says she is. And then some. So you also have Diego Luna, who plays that's the Bat Prince. Yeah. Uh, working working with Diego Luna uh, as, as Hats, uh, sort of the potential love interest to Maya, was awesome because I got to reunite uh, Zoe and Diego uh, from Book of Life, Book right? Of they, Life. Were, they were Manolo and Maria, but also from Spielberg's The Terminal. Uh, they have a love story in that one. So this is the, the third cinematic universe uh, love story between those two. Uh, and yeah, working with Diego was, was a fantastic experience. I've, I've known Diego since Book of Life, and we kind of hit it off. And it wasn't looking good uh, as far as getting him because of Star Wars, but he made it work. His, his, uh, he, he really, not only, you know, Diego is a brilliant artist, but he's also a brilliant director. Uh, so he... He really sort of got in there and we talked about all the, what, you know, he, Sats is basically a spaghetti Western character. So we kept saying the less he says, the more it'll mean. So we, we, we it's, he's a really cool character. Uh, you know, I got to work with other, other amazing, amazing actors that I super adore, uh, Danny Trejo and Cheech Marin. And then, of course, I got to work with, uh, Rosie Perez, who's someone I, I've always wanted to work with. I've always loved her her work. Uh, and then I got to work with, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big hip-hop fan, especially uh, I was a teenager in the 90s. So uh, two of my dreams came true. I got to work with Queen Latifah. Uh, and I get to I got to work with uh, White Cliff John from the Fugees. Uh, so that, that was also kind of a, a dream come true. And then for the villain, uh, Lord Miklan, you know, the this god is of the, war. This is the god of my my fantasy version of the god of war. It had to be someone huge, and the easy play for him would have been just an evil, you know, monster voice. But I got really into this idea that you know, war is very seductive. People get seduced into these conflicts, uh, and I remembered Alfred Molina and uh, and Salma Hayek's uh, Frida. I, I I that you know that he's a. He's a monster in that movie, but he's very charming and very, very seductive and very charismatic. So I, I remember at the first record with, with Alfred, uh, you know, I think he assumed I loved him because of Spider-Man 2. And of course, he's brilliant in Spider-Man 2. But I just raved to him about his Diego Rivera performance. You know, as a Mexican, I was like, who, who, who dares play Diego Rivera? And then after seeing that performance, I was blown away. So he, he was super happy. Uh, that 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 specific character is the reason why uh, you know a Mexican kid like me or Mexican old old kid like me adores him. And you wrote that character inspired by the Aztec god of death, isn't that right? Yes. Uh, so in a lot of the uh, you know obviously there's a lot of gods in the in the pantheon and uh, you know over 500. There's literally a god for when you cheat uh, on your significant other. Like, literally, there's a god for that. We got gods for everything. Uh, and so going through the Pantheon, I really went, all right, well, what, you know, this is a fantasy version, so which ones do I want to highlight? What will they all mean? What are the, what do they represent in our story? So obviously, death and war have to be married. Uh, they go hand in hand. Uh, obviously, the, the, you, there's established ideas of what those things mean, but for me, it was how do we subvert those things and how do we make those things more specific to uh, our story and, and, you know, reflect what's going on in the world today and reflect what's going on uh, with the culture today. 
so we also should talk about Maya's parents. So King Tekka is, uh, you, you have described as a teddy bear that can kill you. And his wife, Queen Tekka, is a diplomat. And uh, you voice King Tekka and your wife, Sandra Akiwa, who is also a character animator and creative consultant on Maya and the Three, voices the queen. Tell us about doing those voices. <laughs> so that, that, you know, that was quite the experience. Uh, early on in my career, I would always write from the point of view of the kids. And now that I'm a father, I found myself not only writing as a, as a parent, but also agreeing with my parents uh, about a lot of the things uh, that they used to say to me that I hated as a teenager. So it was, it was a role reversal. And then uh, this is such a big, giant character. I mean, he, he's kind of a mix of how my wife describes me to people or the voice she does when she's imitating me. Uh, so that's kind of where that dad came from. Uh, and also there's this idea, uh, and, and, you know, especially in, in, in the, the perceived version of, of, of Mexican men in media, uh, that they can't be tender and ferocious, right? It's one or the other. So I really wanted to add those those layers to him. Uh, and then the queen, Queen Tekka, uh, Sandra, my wife, designed her. Uh, and, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful design with with the, the deer horns sort of implying she's from the north. All these beautiful, beautiful references. Uh, uh, she's from, her family's from Michoacan, so there's a lot of references to her family. And early on, I wanted her to be the voice. And she, when she saw the cast, she was like, oh, hells no, I'm not doing the voice. I'm not going to act with all these brilliant people. So I said, no, 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 here's what we'll do. You'll do scratch. And then as you, you know, because we need to keep going, so you just do the scratch. And then eventually, you know, I'll replace you with a, with a, with a famous actress. And so I had to trick her. I had to trick her. It was like uh, Mr. T in the A-team uh, to get him on the plane. She did this brilliant performance, and we started animating, and then at some point she went, wait a second, you're not replacing me? And she figured it out, and, and you know, of course we love each other, and we are very respectful of each other, but when we tested the show, because they, they tested it early, uh, they asked everybody what they thought of, of, the, of the queen, and people loved it, and that was kind of my proof to her. I'm like, look. People who don't know you, who don't know any of the names, who just watched this, love this character. You designed her. I basically wrote her for you, and you acted in it. Just, just let the love happen. And <laughs> she begrudgingly said, oh, okay, but I don't think I can get her again. I think you talked to me. <laughs> Did you record together? Because, I mean, the, the chemistry is so obvious when you see the two of them talking. Yeah, we we uh, we recorded together, and then you know a lot of those arguments and the way they interact. That's basically us in real life dealing with our son, and so literal arguments we would have. I would put him in the thing, and she'd get so angry. And now <laughs> even in fights, she's like, "You're gonna use this somewhere." I'm like, "Well, it's my it's my job. I have to." Generally speaking, did you record the characters individually or together? It was mostly individually because uh, everybody's schedule was so crazy. Uh, but we did get to do some, some basically just me and her were the only times where we recorded together. Once COVID hit, then it was really impossible to do that stuff. Was a lot of the voice work done during COVID? Yeah, I would say uh, a big chunk was done during COVID. And early on, that was our biggest concern, right? How, how, how are we going to get people, you know, Netflix would send kits to people's houses to record, but you can't really do that with a lot of people. And, and people were getting sort of bad recordings. Like the performances are great, but the, but the recordings were bad. So there was a lot of figuring stuff out. We got really, really lucky uh, in that a lot of our actors had either were basically they figured out how to make it work and we figured out how to make it work. But we got to the point where we were animating shots. Uh, that were scratch, that were wide shots, and then we were just holding the close-ups until we got the real voices. Like, it got really crazy. But, I mean, it's nothing. It's nothing compared to what other people were dealing with. So I think COVID just proved animation is built for remote. Like, we can, we've always worked with people from all over the world in different places, and this just made it, to some extent, it made it easier. You started to talk about the design of uh, Queen Tekka, but um, let's talk about the character design a bit. Would you describe Maya? 
All right, so the character designs on, on my uh, uh, my wife, Sandra Kiwa, and I are the character designers. Usually she designs all the female characters, and then I design all the male characters. So, uh, and we tend to uh, collaborate on some and get in these crazy fights. So, for example, Maya was a big collaboration between the both of us, and we really wanted to stay away from, uh, when we did the research, these sort of idealized, super skinny Anglo-sized, uh, you know, half-naked Mayan and Aztec princesses that you see in calendars and all this stuff. So we really wanted to sort of go away from that and go with what Sandra looked like as a teenager. And she was, you know, she cut her hair as a as a sort of a rebellious thing to 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 society and to her parents at that time. Uh, and then she she was a, she was a tough girl so we we wanted to make her stocky we wanted to make her legs chunky like this is a character that when you look at her you're like oh boy i you know i better be careful because she she might do something to me so that was sort of the inspiration and then everything in her design is not symmetrical so one side of her hair is longer than the other her paint uh, on her arms is uh, is basically doesn't match her skirt is sideways the idea was that she was unbalanced when she becomes an eagle warrior, she's wearing her mother's eagle warrior suit, and everything is symmetrical. She finds peace in being a warrior, but then her hair is still long on one side, so up there, there's still some conflict going on. And that's basically her dilemma. They want me to be a diplomat, I want to be a warrior, and then the theme of the show is, you can be both. You can be anything. You don't have to pick one or the other. Would you also describe the, the look of that? All right, so so you know I'm a I'm a Batman fan, and so uh, I also love uh, a lot of the in the museums they have these beautiful beautiful sculptures uh, that people of that time were making of the gods, uh, and so these are artist representations of what the what the you know the pantheon looked like, and Kamasot specifically is the god of bats, and so when I saw that I was like, ah, Batman, this is where Batman comes from. And so I went, literally, I went back to the source uh, and I, I designed Sots to look like a vampire, uh, a, a sexy vampire prince, uh, very much inspired by those Kamasot sculptures. And at the same time, I wanted to sell this idea that, you know, Mexico is about two cultures coming together, right? The Spanish and, 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 and the Aztecs uh, and Mayans who were there. And so this idea of a dark skinned girl with a pale guy uh, literally joining to create this new world. That was sort of the implication between those two. And um, do you want to also describe the look of the Jaguar brothers? These are Maya's brothers, which uh, I think you've described as loosely your uh, Ninja Turtles. <laughs> yeah. So in in the in the sort of in the popular culture, uh, usually you see the Aztec eagle warriors, but then you also see the Aztec uh, Jaguar warriors and you know they have very very beautiful outfits so for for this thing i said ah this is my opportunity uh i've always wanted to work with gael garcia bernal who uh who ended up voicing them in, in english and in spanish and so i said well instead of making these super serious super stoic warriors i think these guys should be like high school quarterbacks like they're the stars of the team and so i made we made them really really amicable and really goofy. I mean, they're still super badass, uh, but we got to sort of take advantage of, here's how you see them in all these paintings, but these guys are just like you. And then the other thing was, like you said, I'm a big Ninja Turtles fan, so I got to do my Mesoamerican Ninja Turtles uh, version of, of Three Brothers. Or hey, do you want to pick one other character that you want to talk about? I'd love to uh, to pick... Uh, Lady Mikte. So Lady Mikte is played by uh, Kate Del Castillo uh, in English and in Spanish. And Lady Mikte, I can't say who she is uh, too much about her, but she is a goddess of death, not the goddess of death, because there was a lot of goddesses of death. Uh, and she's kind of a mysterious character early on. Uh, and she, you, you kind of, obviously, you kind of don't like her for a while. But she, uh, having done Book of Life, having done La Muerte, we took it upon ourselves to go, all right, well, that's the representation of death in that time period in Mexico. Now we're going back. We're going way back, right, to the root, literally the roots of, of Day of the Dead and the roots of 
this iconography with skulls. And so it was a very complicated character for us. And then knowing her arc, how she starts basically as a statue and then slowly, slowly becomes human and slowly grows, grows a heart. Uh, that was also a big deal for us. But yeah, she, she's a, a design and a character that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see people dress up as her at Comic-Con. So how much research did you do for this? I can imagine it must have been an awful lot. Well, you know, the, definitely a lot of research, but a lot of the research was looking into things and reading about it. I mean, I watch a lot of documentaries uh, and realizing I don't want to do a documentary. I don't want to do a super specific, this is this God and this is this, uh, you know, this culture. I didn't, I, what I started to realize was there, the history is so complicated and there's different schools as to what happened and who it happened to. And obviously there's the Spanish version of everything that happened. There's the, you know, there's different schools of thought in just in Mexico of what happened. And then of course, in Central America and El Salvador and Guatemala, like everybody has their version of it and they don't always agree. And unfortunately the, uh, the Spanish burnt a lot of the codices, all the, the books of, of history. So there's not that much stuff left. So it's a lot of interpreting. And so what I, what I realized was what I want to do is what my heroes have done, right? So I'm a big art lover. And I started to look at, wow, look at how Diego Rivera interpreted that era. Look at how Siqueiros, look at how, you know, my favorite one is Jorge Gonzalez Camarena. You know, how, look at how Frida Kahlo interpreted this time period. And I said, that's what I need to do as a, as a filmmaker and as an artist. This is now my interpretation. So just like Book of Life was my version of, of Day of the Dead, this needs to be my fantasy version of this time period. And I think that's what freed me. And that's what allowed the humor to happen. And I think that's what allowed it to become what it became. Because early on, it was very serious. And even I went, I don't want to do this. This is, this is like a history lesson. And that's not what this should be. You talked about the inspirations for the different lands earlier, but let's talk about production design. Would you elaborate on Tekka? A absolutely. Uh, so our production designer was Paul Sullivan from the Book of Life. And then our art director was Gerald de Jesus, who was my Emmy winning uh, art director on El Tigre. So I got to, I got to bring those guys together. Uh, and the, the kingdom of Tekka, which is where Maya is from, is very much inspired by the Aztecs. Uh, and there's two specific cities we referenced, Tenochtitlan and Teotihuacan. And again, these were places that I was taken to as a kid, and they look like ruins, right? This is like ancient, ancient places. And then you see paintings, and they go, this is what it actually looked like. And it's full of life, and it's full of people, and it's full of color. And so I, when we started designing tech, I said, that's what I want. I want to show this fantasy version that as a kid we're only told about, but we never get to see and we never get to experience. So that was the idea for Tekka. The whole world for this, um, this series is just so vibrant and colorful. When going into it, what was your initial idea? Uh, well, you know, one of the things that happened to me was uh, I was very lucky and my parents, uh, whenever we had money, they basically, we traveled. Uh, my dad kept saying, uh, the best investment are experiences. So whenever we have money, we're going to travel. That's a great quote. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's very Mexican, but he'll, he would say, the one thing no one can steal from you is experiences. So that's what we'll do. Uh, and so I got to go to Machu Picchu uh, when I was 17 or 18. And going up the, the trolley and walking literally into, into, it seemed like we went in a time machine and I got to see what the world would be like a thousand years ago. And it felt like I was in the clouds. So that it, that was those feelings of going, these cultures are so ancient and they're so part of us. That's kind of what I wanted to, to make the, the audience feel. Like, especially in Latin America, to go, hey, I know you, everybody loves anime and I know that everybody loves uh, Hollywood movies. But holy cow, you guys should look inside look at where we come from we literally have the the blood of warriors in us so in general jorge tell us about creating the animation 
Uh, so we were very, very lucky. We got paired up uh, with a brilliant, brilliant artist, uh, artisan and production heaven uh, studio called Tangent Animation in Toronto and Vancouver. And they are you. They used a software called Blender, which is an open source software. And because of that software, because of the way they work, we got to work with uh, talent from all, literally all over the world: uh, Mexicans, Brazilians, Israelis, Russians. Like it was like the UN over there. It was amazing. Uh, and and of course, uh, they had never done three movies in a row. I'd never done three movies in a row. No one had done three movies in a row. So we were figuring out how to do it all at once. Uh, and I still, you know, I still believe that not knowing is what allowed it to happen. I think if any of us would have known what what we were getting ourselves into, maybe we wouldn't have done it. Uh, but it was a brilliant, brilliant experience. Uh, I got to work with, you know, my, some of my favorite artists and, and people in the universe. Unfortunately, that studio is no longer... Uh, alive, uh, you know, other stuff happened after we finished Maya, and that studio has uh, has disappeared. Thankfully, uh, all these brilliant artists found jobs immediately because there's a ton of work in Canada. Uh, but I'm, but I'm, you know, I'm genuinely sad that uh, I I wanted to make my next movie with those guys, and now they're not together. The the animation and I guess the music as well was was all done remotely. Yeah, the music for, for Maya and the Three, uh, I got to work with, you know, two-time Oscar-winning uh, Gustavo Santolaya and Tim Davies, who uh, both of them did the music for The Book of Life. So again, uh, I, got, I got the band back together, literally. We got to record with an orchestra. Uh, you know, I'm a big Indian Morricone fan, so I got to get all my choirs in there. And, uh, and then also as a, as a lover of Latin alternative music, I got to put some Mexica Sky in this thing. I got to put some Norteño accordion music in there. Like I got to put music from all these things that uh, people don't usually think of when they think of Mesoamerica. And I remember talking to, to Gustavo and saying, imagine what people in the world, when they watched, you know, Fistful of Dollars and they heard an electric the guitar for the first time, right? They heard Ennio Morricone for the first time. Like they must've gone, what the, what is this? That's what we wanted to do. We wanted to, all right, you're in the past, but the music is of today. And do you want to talk about the sound as well? So I I got really, really lucky. Uh, Scott Gershwin, who, who did all the sound design for the Book of Life, uh, not only agreed to, to be the designer of this thing, but he also agreed to be the mixer. Uh, and... I, I, again, I think it's because of COVID we got lucky. Uh, people were, were uh, they had a lot more time in their hands than usual. So it was a dream come true to get to work with Scott again. And the movie, the, you know, the series sounds like, they don't, it doesn't sound like a movie. It sounds like giant, big, expensive, glorious movies. Uh, and Scott was brilliant. And we did a ton of stuff uh, that usually you never get to do with a TV show. So this, this looks like a movie and it sounds like a movie and hopefully it hits like a movie. What are your feelings on where you see animation heading, the business of animation heading? Oh man, I think if anything, uh, we're, in a, we're entering a crazy period because there's too many projects and there's not enough service studios uh, all over the world. And so what's gonna happen is a lot of boutiques and a lot of first time studios they're going to get a shot and it's there for the taking. And then a lot of the dinosaur or older studios, uh, they're going to be looking at their budgets and they're going to be going, wait a second, how much did that movie cost in that place? How much are the tax breaks in this other place? And, you know, you started to see it. Disney opening a studio in Canada, uh, you know, which it had done before. It's still going back. Uh, it's got to be because of the tax breaks. So I definitely think that is happening. The thing that I think I find very positive is this idea that you have to move, you know, especially if you were a foreigner like me, that you have to move to the U.S. and uproot your family. And then you're, you know, you live and die by your work visa and things don't work out and you literally get deported or have to find another place. That has gone away because now that we all have proven that we can work from home and we can work remotely, people are getting to work from 
their home countries and getting to live uh, their lives in, in places where they rather be. And so on Maya, we had a lot of talent who lived in Mexico, who lived in Peru, who lived in Brazil, and it was smooth. And when the pandemic hit, it didn't affect us at all. I think on Maya, we must, might have lost a day. That's it. We just kept going. It was, it was, uh, so I do think it, there's never been more work. There's never been crazier, uh, work. But I also think this can't last. This is just too much. They, you know, it's got to, it's got to course correct. There's just too much stuff happening. It's an interesting view. What's next for you? <laughs> Uh, I'm super, super excited. Uh, so I, I, you know, I signed an overall with Netflix to do a lot of stuff. So I have a lot of stuff cooking in development that I'm super, super excited. Uh, the big, big, big one is uh, my first feature since Book of Life. Uh, I just started writing. Uh, literally, you know, behind me, there's all these panels uh, of what that's going to be. And they, they probably won't announce it for a while and they probably won't announce it who it's with. Uh, but I am after having done three and a half, no, three movies and, and the scope of Maya, I generally, a movie now feels like, all right, this is a, this is a vacation. It's just one. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you'd like to share before we wrap? Uh, you know what? One of the, one of the cool things uh, that happened on, on, on Maya, and we talk about this all the time, whatever the thing you're making is about is kind of what happens behind the scenes. So, for example, for me, uh, El Tigre with my wife Sandra is about Manny and, and his best friend Frida getting in trouble. And that sure felt like that's what was happening behind the scenes making that show. We were constantly getting in trouble. Uh, Book of Life was literally about an artist trying to convince the world and, you know, his, 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 his village and, and the girl of his dreams that what he was doing was, was worth it. And he had to die in order to convince everybody. And that definitely felt like what I had to go through to make that movie. <laughs> and now with Maya, same thing. It was, you know, Maya is about this, this girl who has all these things, but doesn't want them. She wants freedom. Uh, and I think that's every artist and that's every director. And so she has to now go on this journey to get people to help her. And then she realizes she's stronger when she has friends and, and you know th this is african saying that we also kept referring to and it was if you want to go fast you go alone but if you want to go far you go together and so that's kind of what it felt making this thing like the more we we sort of grouped together the, the further we went and then ultimately maya you know the, the, had to make a big sacrifice and that definitely felt like what we had to do to get this thing uh to happen during covid so yeah, it was it was amazing how everything you make becomes the process of making it. I'm so glad we finally got to do this podcast. We've been saying for a while that we wanted to do it when you're finished with the project. Oh, Carol, I and, and honestly, you know, I think when we finished this, I think even at Netflix, they were like, wait a second, you guys finished on time? Like, we for sure thought you were going to be delayed. I think no one could believe it. But I, I man, I feel like, I've been cooking this delicious dish and I cannot wait to serve it. And it's like, I'm the, I'm the waiter uh, with the tray full of food, just going like, just let me serve this, please. Well, congratulations. And thank you so much for talking to us about it. Oh, thank you, Carolyn. It's so great to see you. 